everyone. Welcome to the Bay Area Virtual Book Festival. For the next hour, we're going to be talking about voting rights and unrigging the rules for the rising American electorate. My name is Rebecca Nagel, and I am joined by Steve Phillips, a columnist at The Nation and the host of the podcast, Democracy in Color. Thanks, Steve, for joining us. Thanks for having me on. And David Daly, author of Rat Fucked, Why Your Vote Doesn't Count, and the upcoming book, Unrigged, How Americans Battled Back to Save Democracy. Democracy. Thanks for joining us, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, everybody. And uh, my name is Rebecca Nagel. I'm a citizen of Cherokee, Cherokee Nation, a journalist and host of the podcast, This Land. And I'm really, really excited to dig into this conversation over the next hour because I think it is more important now than ever. I think, you know, in this moment of a global pandemic, we are seeing the systemic failures of our government right now. You know, sort of all of the cracks in the system that were already existing are sort of more apparent than ever. Um, um, and I think a lot of us have our eyes on the upcoming election and if that election is going to be a solution or make the problem worse. So, Steve, I'll direct the first question to you. You know, with a lot of Democrats having a singular focus on beating Donald Trump in November. There's a lot of debate about whether or not those efforts should be voted on or should be focused on converting Trump voters, say working class white voters over to the Democratic side or increasing voter turnout among people of color and young voters who vote reliably Democrat. Democrat. Um, what do you think is the best strategy? Yeah, so all of the empirical data shows that the way to win these elections is to really, it's, it's to replicate and build down what was the Obama coalition, right, which was lar overwhelming numbers of people of color combined with what I call the meaningful minority of progressive whites. So anywhere from 37 to 40 percent um, of white voters. And so that has been, a, that's a majority of people in the country. It's a majority of eligible voters and for both of, well, not only both, both of Obama's elections, but also in 2016, which we forget is that Hillary Clinton won the popular vote mm -hmm. by 3 million votes. So that's the winning coalition. And all of this notion around we have to win back the working class white voters um, lacks empirical data that that's even possible beyond those who are already largely with us who are the more progressive sector of that population. So, you know, it's, and then I think the overarching fact, which people don't appreciate is I think as they approach that, Democrats have not won the white vote overall since 1964, prior to Lyndon Johnson signing the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. And so this, no, Jimmy Carter lost the white vote when he ran, like white Southern governor with a drawl, right? So this notion that there's this huge potential, like you're saying, win back the working class uh, white voters, mm -hmm. they have not been there for 40 or 50 years. Exactly. And, so, and then you take add to that the uh, trends in the population. Fastest growing sectors of the population are people of color, Asians and Latinos in particular, then African Americans and then whites, right? So if you're gonna align yourself with what's growing rather than what's shrinking, that the logical thing to do is to double down on and go to those who have historically been receptive to a democratic message. Mm -hmm. That's logical, but... Whether and you, you spoke to those shifting demographics um, in a column you wrote for The Nation about a year ago, which I think in um, coronavirus years just feels like a decade ago <laughs> now. Um, but you talked about that, how um, Trump in his re-election bid is actually not the front runner um, statistically because, and part of that is because of these shifting demographics. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's, um, and again, that's also, you know, that is the, that was the foundation of actually why, you know, I wrote my book, Brown is the New White, was I thought people were not grasping the uh, lessons of the Obama coalition and of actually how Obama won. Right. People don't realize that Obama would have lost to Reagan because the country was that much less diverse at the time. Yeah. So that's just in terms of how all that plays itself out. And so again, back to the thing about Trump, the presumption is because he's been so terrible and so much destruction and so much damage that he must be very popular. He must have a lot of support and he must be very hard to defeat. He has not and has never had 
majority support. He didn't win the election with majority support. He lost uh, uh, by 3 million votes in the popular vote in the three states where he won the election, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. He didn't win a majority in those states. And so what you had is people splintering and going to third and fourth parties. And his popularity, his approval ratings have never gone up above 50%. I mean, maybe close to the height of when people give him a, a benefit of the doubt around the pandemic. But then they've all already begun to come, to come back down. So he does not, and has never had majority support. People feel like anybody that confident and you know cavalier and whatnot must have support, but he does not. And so I think it's very important that progressives carry themselves with the confidence that we, in fact, represent the majority of people in this country. And he does not. And what he is advancing does not. It's dismaying that so many people do support him, but that's not the majority of the people. Yeah. And I think that's one thing that I think too a lot about a lot in this conversation about how are we going to win over Trump voters? I think, you know, if you look at his approval ratings, they've been low, they've moved some, but haven't moved that dramatically. And then I also think to myself a lot, if everything that Trump has done has not already converted Trump voters, what could Democrats possibly do <laughs> in 2020 that would change people's minds? Yeah. yeah. Now, I would say, so in our last in our, uh, uh, podcast we had in the beginning of, in the middle of March, we had Ron Brownstein, a columnist and journalist uh, for the CNN and The Atlantic. And he has coined this phrase, I think it's one of the best descriptions of what's happening in the country about this. We were engaged in a battle between the coalition of transformation, which is the Obama coalition, mm -hmm. multiracial, multicultural, and the coalition of restoration, right, which is this make America great again crowd, take America back. And that is what we are engaging in. It's very, I think it's very uh, uh, similar, if not an extension, of the post-Civil War period. Yeah. So there aren't many people up for grabs in that. You're either in one of these two camps, and that's what I think a lot of people don't understand about politics at this moment. Yeah. And we know that the presidential election is just one piece of sort of these big policy shifts that a lot of people are talking about. And another really important part of that piece is Congress um, and state rep uh, state uh, houses and state senates. And so I want to bring in um, David Daly to talk about um, this aspect, because one important piece of that is not just who's voting and in what numbers, but how those votes are counted and actually equal representation. And so you you literally wrote the book on gerrymandering. So can you talk to us about how um, voter turnout is just sort of one piece of the pie that we have to be thinking about in terms of winning elections? Absolutely, Rebecca. Um, and I signed on to Steve's analysis completely. Um, I think he's got it exactly right. Um, and I like Ron Brownstein's um, a formulation of this as well. Coalitions of, of transformation versus coalitions of restoration. And when two groups are relatively e equally matched, where the lines are drawn between them in competitive states and who controls the drawing of those lines matters an awful lot. And my first book really tells the story of two elections. It's the story of 2008, um, in which you get the election of Barack Obama, you get a Democratic supermajority in the US Senate, and a renewed Democratic majority in the House. And if you go back and you look at the TV coverage, at the news coverage of that night, people talked about how uh, the changing demographics of this nation was going to make the Republican Party a minority party in this country for a generation to come. Mm -hmm. And well, it didn't exactly work out that way, did it? Um, and what a handful of really sophisticated Republican uh, strategists realized was that as important and historic an election as 2008 may have been, 2010 had the potential to be that much more consequential because it was a redistricting year, it was a census year, Every state legislative and congressional line in the country was going to be redrawn in, in immediately after the 2010 election. Um, and there was the ability to use redistricting as a path back to power if they could um, flip state legislatures in all of these key states and force Democrats out of the room entirely when these new lines mm -hmm. were being drawn. Um, so. They launched a plan called Red Map. It's short for the 
redistricting majority project, and they target state legislative races, these down ballot, really inexpensive races um, in states like Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Florida, North Carolina, Wisconsin, states we keep talking about, states that are closely divided swing states in which the power to draw the lines is the power to decide winners and losers for a decade to come. And that's exactly what happened by winning 107 key state legislative races in 2010, Republicans were able to control not only uh, drawing almost all of the, uh, they were able to control not only a huge majority of congressional seats, Mm -hmm. the Republicans were able to draw almost six to one by themselves, over Democrats in 2011 for Congress, but they were also able to draw the lines for all of these state legislatures. And it defined the state of play and it pushed policy further to the right in all of these states. It leads to an attack and an assault on voting rights in all of these states. Um, And what you continue to see, what just played out in Wisconsin, um, Mm -hmm. and April is a direct result of the the state legislative elections in 2010 that Republicans focused on and that Democrats simply fell asleep on. They had a huge impact. So in 2012, we re-elect Barack Obama. Democrats still have the U.S. Senate, and they get 1.4 million more votes or Congress for the, for the, the House. And yet Republicans hold on to the House. 234, 201. It's not even close. Um, in all of these states, in Pennsylvania, in North Carolina, in Wisconsin, in Michigan, in Ohio, Democrats get more votes for the state house. They get more votes for Congress. But what you see are these delegations that are entirely lopsided towards the right. 13-5 in Pennsylvania, 12-4 in Ohio, 10-3 in North Carolina, super majorities in state legislatures that are one with fewer votes. And it has pushed politics to the right, and it gave them the ability then to... First, so uh, gerrymandering is the first step of this, and what you then see in many of these states since then are voter ID laws, are, are purges of of voter rolls, our precinct closures, our, you know, making it more difficult to uh, uh, vote absentee in many of these states again and again and again. Uh, so you have these two, two close sides, uh, these two coalitions in a pitched battle, uh, but one side is making most of the rules about how those elections are being fought and waged, and they're doing so with the support of the courts, uh, and they're doing so in a way that continues to give themselves unfair and and anti-democratic and anti-majoritarian advantages again and again and again. And Steve, I wanted to see if you could speak to that too, because I think, you know, some of the hope and... um, changing demographics that you talk about um, that is good news for the Democratic Party. It seems that has been met equally with voter suppression, especially among um, communities of color. Um, You know, during the Democratic primary, we already saw extremely long lines in communities of color. You know, in Milwaukee, during a global pandemic, a city that normally has 180 polling locations, people were crammed into just Live. Um, and so how is voter suppression in communities of color going to impact the outcome of the 2020 election and what can be done about it? Right. So, so you mean like how the uh, Wisconsin Supreme Court at, by teleconference <laughs> to go out in public and to decide that the people should go out and vote in public, that type of uh, voter suppression? Um, before I get to that, can I actually ask um, David a question around what he was talking about? Oh, yeah, totally. I found very, um, well, a couple of things, with a, point, a, a, a comment and a question. One of the things people don't understand about 2010 is how much there was a lack of voter turnout on the Democratic side. Yeah. 
And so there, there's a misperception that what happened was all these different people voted for Obama, changed their minds and switched and voted for Republicans because of health care. Yeah. But that's actually not what the data shows. So the Democratic vote dropped dramatically. Mm-hmm. So I think that's important for people to bear in mind. But I'm interested in terms of your research, David, what did you, who was the behind and who had both the insight and if, if you know anything about the funding on the right to sure. say, this is what we're going to go after? Because clearly it was not a priority on the progressive side. So that's what did exactly you learn right. about how they came to focus on that as the thing to go after? It's a fascinating story, um, and it really starts as simple as a Republican strategist named Chris Jankowski works at something called the Republican State Leadership Commission, mm-hmm. um, and he reads an article in the New York Times one day about uh, how the, the census is coming up and it's going to involve st- and that the governors who are elected in 2010 are going to play an important role in state legislatures. And he was a state legislative guy. He came up working with the legislatures in South Carolina, working with the Republican Attorney General Association. And it was, so, it was almost like a eureka moment for him. Uh, and he takes this back to the RSLC, which is led by Ed Gillespie, former chair of the party. Um, and they begin making a power um, a point, and they begin taking it around the country. They raise $30 million. And it's from the usual uh, sources on the right. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's Philip Morris, it's Altria, it's the Chamber of Commerce, it's, you know, a lot of the usual, um, you know, funding sources. Uh, uh, Karl Rove writes an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal in March of 2010 that lays the entire plan out. You see it now and you want to indict the entire leadership of the Democratic Party for incompetence, for not picking up the newspaper that day. Because Rove lays out the strategy. He says what they're going to do. He says what the consequences of it are going to be. And he lays out even the individual states and neighborhoods that they're going to play in. And he's like, we are going to win these state legislative races. We're going to take control of state legislatures. And when these Uh, Districts are redrawn the following year. We're going to have total control of the process, and we're going to do this for less than $30 million. You can't lose a Senate race in this country now for less than 20 at that price. Right. This is the the biggest heist in modern American politics. And you've got all these different major donors on the the progressive side spending far more money than that in terms of the various uh, allocations that they make. And so this is, you know, between, you know, well, for one, Bloomberg spent $800 million on his presidential campaign. (laughs) If he had spent that money on building infrastructure for state legislature, I mean, once again, we're talking in 2020, we are talking in another state legislative year. If Bloomberg and Steyer had spent that money on state legislative races, if they put it down ballot, in Pennsylvania, in Texas, in Arizona, in some of these important states where, once again, a handful of seats could determine the balance of power for a decade to come, right. it would have been so much more valuable than right. lighting it on fire in a testament to right. their own egos. And in thinking about like what is coming up with redistricting, one thing I wanted to ask you about, David, is about the U.S. Census, because now that we're in this moment of coronavirus, we know that the U.S. Census is doing a lot less door to door work. And I can just speak from um, for Native communities, you know, Native Americans living on reservations were the most likely, you know, they call us hard to count, but we're the most likely to not get counted. And we also have one of the highest rates of what's called in-person enumeration, where somebody actually comes and knocks on your door and talks to you. But all of that has been paused for good reason because of public safety concerns. Um, but there's, you know, I, you know, what I'm hearing from tribal leaders and, you know, people who are advocating on the Hill in Washington is panic that the undercount in 2020 is going to be even, is going to be historically high than when we already know that communities of color are undercounted and that white communities are actually overcounted in the census. So can you talk about like why the census count is so important for democratic representation and what are the efforts happening right now in sort of the new landscape of coronavirus to make sure that people get counted? The census is a hot mess. I mean, it is 
crucial. Uh, the census is the building block of first reapportionment, which determines how many members of Congress every state gets. And once you determine how many members of Congress that state gets, that's also how many, that's the beginning of how many electoral college votes mm -hmm. your state gets. Um, and then after apportionment is set, um, the census becomes the, the building block of redistricting of, of state legislatures and, and, um, and congressional seats. So an accurate count is absolutely key for all of those reasons, in addition to yeah. uh, the, the trillions of dollars of funding that the census controls. Yeah. And Steve, I, I want to get back to you and, and getting back to kind of thinking about democratic politics leading up to um, the 2020 election. You know, during the primary season, we see people sort of discussing different votes and different voter, profi voter profiles. And we see the white vote get talked about in this way that is endlessly complex, right? So there are um, rural voters, urban voters, suburban voters, you know, white male men without a college education, white women with a college education. But when voters of color are talked about, you know, it's sort of always as this one big group where there is the black vote or the Latina vote. And I was wondering if you think that this lack of nuance um, or complexity international conversation, specifically among Democrats, disadvantages voters of color? Um, yes and no, right? I mean, it's, I used, I was, um, Obama, Obama got 96% of the black vote. And I'd always say, I really want to know who that 4% is. <laughs> in terms of that whole, what is at stake in this country? Right. I mean, I did a piece for the New York Times called Trump is trying to make America white again. And that is really the fundamental dividing line within this country. I mean, the very first immigration law in this country, the 1790 Immigration Naturalization Act, says to be a U.S. citizen, you have to be a free white person. And that was immigration policy in this country from 1790 until the 1950s. And so this whole question, are you white or not? remains at the core of the American identity, American politics. And so it's so in some sense, and that, that I would say is a big part of why 90 plus percent of African Americans vote, uh, well, Democratic or certainly against the Republicans. So to that extent, um, and I used to, I would sometimes joke or sarcastically comment about, it. there's a lot of talk in Democratic operative spaces about modeling and you get these, you can do these models and target and find, look at their, you know, what kind of, you know, beer they drink and cars <laughs> they drive and figure out who's progressive, et cetera. And my joke, which isn't a joke at all, actually, is that all this modeling is how do you find progressive white people? Because mm -hmm. all you actually have to do is find black people and they tend to be actually more progressive in terms of their, in terms of their voting and whatnot. So to a certain extent, I don't think that, I mean, it, there is a, a basis that African-Americans in particular, people of color in general, are treated differently and more negatively by the country as a whole. Mm -hmm. That's why we have this gargantuan racial wealth gap and all these different uh, uh, distinctions in terms of who holds power and who doesn't hold power. So at that level, it is a clear cut thing. Mm -hmm. But it does not lend itself towards deeper. And then also what's important, I think, which is a very important part towards 2020, is because the country is so narrowly divided that any kind of small incursions make an impact. Mm -hmm. right? One of the things people don't grasp is that there was a somewhere in the like six to eight plus percent drop in black male support for the Democratic ticket. Right? Black women were right there. 93 plus percent, but black men did drop. There were some number of black men which actually went over to Trump. It, not accidentally, I would argue, in terms of him running against a woman, right? So if you start to make that kind of more nuanced understanding and appeal and peel off, they don't need to peel, they don't need to win black voters. They just need yeah. to whittle the margins down a little bit. And so the sophistication on the right is deeper in that regard than it is on the Democratic side to understand. I will, I guess, finally say that I think in terms of actually deeply understanding and uh, authentically connecting with the different communities, that having that level of depth of knowledge and insight 
And so that to know that the majority of Latinos in Texas are Mexican American, but the majority of Latinos in uh, Florida are Cuban and Puerto Rican. Those are very different backgrounds, right? So just your average white consultant isn't necessarily gonna have that kind of insight. And that does uh, uh, work against the effectiveness of the work that the Democrats will be doing. Yeah. You can, yeah. Oh, go ahead, David. Nope. Say, you, can, you can try to peel off individual percentage points of that vote, or you can try to put up barriers to the ballot box that make it harder for those vote. people <laughs> to vote. <laughs> uh, you know? Uh, yeah. Or you can do both of those things. And, um, I mean, if you look at 2016 again, you know, I mean, Hillary Clinton wins by the popular vote by almost 3 million votes, but Donald Trump wins the Electoral College by 80,000 votes in these three gerrymandered states, all of which put barriers and various suppression tools in front of voters, especially voters of color in Milwaukee, in Detroit, in Philadelphia. You know, that is enough in many cases. I mean, the voter ID bill that was enacted by that gerrymandered legislature in Wisconsin helped drive down turnout among black voters in Milwaukee by a couple hundred thousand votes in 2016 over 2012. And certainly some of that could be Obama not being on the ticket and Hillary being on the ticket. But that is a significant number and the ID bill made a big difference. The same thing in North Carolina where a federal court found that what the gerrymandered legislature there did was they targeted black voters with surgical precision. What they did was they enacted a voter ID bill and then the legislature decided that they would research the very specific kinds of ID that black voters in the state were least likely to have. That turned out to be a driver's license. So that is what they required voters have. I was the first reporter to get his hands on the redistricting files of Thomas Hoffler, the late Republican mastermind who was behind so much of this. And as I went through his files for a story last year, uh, what I found were the maps that he used in which he was drawing the North Carolina congressional districts. And famously, there is a line between two of those districts in Greensboro, North Carolina, a majority black city. Uh, the line goes down the heart of North Carolina A&T, the oldest historically black university in the nation. It divides seven dorms on one side, six dorms on the other. Wow. It's two districts that both elect conservative white Republicans. And Thomas Hoffler had in his files spreadsheets of the names of every single college voter in the state, their race, the dorms that they lived in, wow. and whether they had a driver's license or not. Wow. That is the level of specificity at which they are working when they draw these lines. Yeah, we, we saw similar policies at play in North Dakota, you know, after the native vote in North Dakota helped deliver Heidi Heitkamp to the Senate, who was a Democrat in an otherwise pretty red state. Um, they drilled down on native votes because a lot of Native Americans don't have a street address, but live in rural areas where they only have a P.O. box. And so if that was what was on your ID, it wasn't enough. And so um, tribes actually did a huge intervention um, to increase voter turnout out and actually to issue people tribal IDs, which are federal IDs that you can fly with, that you can vote with, that you can do, you know, anything you do with a driver's license, where people could actually get a physical address. So the the specificity and the creativeness when it comes to voter suppression, you know, there is no, there's no end. <laughs> there is absolutely no end. And my favorite coda to the North Dakota story, though, is that, um, while Heidi Heitkamp uh, doesn't win in 2018, the turnout in Native American communities and tribal land goes through the roof. And one of the uh, people elected in 2018 is Ruth Buffalo, yeah. the first Native American Democratic woman elected to the state legislature from North Dakota. And the man that she defeats is the man who in 2013 first proposed that voter ID bill. So... There's a good news out of that story, too. Yeah. And 
And, and with that good news is not just coincidence. It wasn't just that people were mad and they voted in historic numbers. There was a huge effort on the ground to organize people, yes. to get people registered to vote, to get people the types of IDs that they need to, to get them through the hoops and to get people to the polls. And we know that that type of sort of long-term on the ground organizing is the type of thing that makes differences in elections way more than, you know, pundits talking about things, than polling, and then TV ads. Um, and we were going to have a representative here um, from She the People, um, but she couldn't join us. So Steve, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the work that they're doing, because they're investing in long-term coalition building among women of color across the country, but also really focusing on that on-the-ground organizing of increasing voter turnout of women of color in battleground states. Can you talk some about the work that they're doing for 2020? Yeah, no, actually, uh, Amy Allison and the whole She the People effort, you know, incubated with us at Democracy in Color before they went off and launched um, this national effort. And uh, also one thing that people don't realize is people sometimes, I think, um, minimize and marginalize the role of women of color. It's like, well, it's a subset of women, it's a subset of people of color. But in point of fact, we live in a society that has profound systemic widespread racism and profound systemic widespread sexism. And so women of color sit at the intersection of that. So they actually have insight and connections to and relationships to the vast majority of people in the country who are in fact the people uh, who are more uh, uh, disadvantaged in terms of the opportunities and the things that come along. So what she, the people is trying to do is build a network of women of color organizers, leaders, activists, lift up those voices and back those people on the work that they're actually trying to do. There's a lot of empirical evidence. I was talking before right, about you know, black women, the centrality of their role in terms of you know, Clinton's election, Doug Jones in uh, Alabama, when he flipped that seat in Alabama, it was like 97, 98% of black women backed him that actually was able to get him over, uh, uh, over, the, over the line. And then also there's a, a professor uh, at Berkeley, Lisa Garcia Bedoya, who's done a lot of research around, she, I mean, she literally wrote the book on Latino politics, her book is called Latino Politics. And she talks about, um, this whole issue around having a uh, community, a uh, uh, civic web is what she's talking about. So at the core of this web, you have a organ, usually it's a woman and a woman of color in the Latino community, mm -hmm. and then building around that person. And so that person has relationships with their family members and they influence people within their family, their relationships in their community and their neighborhoods, they influence those people. And so that's the fashion by which women of color are such a central part of politics within the country, but there had not previously been a national organization specifically focused on women of color until Amy when it came along and created She the People. And that's the role that it's playing, is really lifting up those issues, those leaders, those people, people like the woman and uh, the people. Under the radar, underappreciated, are the almost revolutionary changes happening in Virginia. So Virginia has taken complete control of the state government now. The Democrats control the legislature and the uh, uh, governorship, lieutenant governorship, attorney general. And they're passing all the, they changed, they got rid of the law making uh, holiday for, in terms of the power of state legislatures, right? The, the, the law honoring Confederate soldiers they're, to move towards democracy. They're actually, you know, they're having, uh, you know, vote by mail, expansion mm -hmm. of democracy, um, they're going to raise a million people in Virginia are going to have increase in their wages through the minimum wage. All of, much of that was driven by an organization um, and coordinated by one of the lead organizations, New Virginia Majority, run by a, a woman of color, Tram Nguyen. And so that's an example of the, of the outsized leveraging impact, right? In Florida, you've got Andrea Mercado running Florida New Majority. We've played a critical role in the work there. In Texas, one of the main organizations is Texas Organizing Project. Michelle Tremiel, women, uh, woman of color, running that. So, stitching those leaders together into more of a formal force is what see the people is doing, and that that is a very overdue and needed addition to the political landscape in the country. And looking forward um, to the election in November, which I think for a lot of us, um, it's hard to take our minds off of because so much is at stake. 
Um, we know that with this global pandemic that elections aren't going to look the same in the near future and may not look the same in a while. Um, so in response, you know, a lot of leaders are talking about um, universal mail-in ballots, but there's growing opposition to that idea. And David, I was wondering if you could talk about who doesn't want there to be mail-in voting right now and why? That's a big question um, and a complicated question. I mean, as you know, um, you know, covering tribal issues as you do, um, this is going to be an election like no other in recent memory, if, if ever. Um, and what I think is going to happen is what we just saw in Wisconsin, is, is not just a warning sign for what's going to happen. That was a dress rehearsal for the Republican plans in, in 2020. Um, it's going to be very, very difficult in many states and many cities to conduct traditional in-person voting. Um, there is still going to be plenty of in-person voting in this election, but there are places... We don't know what November is going to look like, um, whether they're you know, in cooler months again in the fall, whether this uh, comes back again. Um, so what I think we have to be planning for right now is how we safeguard uh, this election. Um, the problems in Wisconsin, in many ways, started with requests for absentee ballots that deluged and overwhelmed underfunded election boards that were not prepared to send back 1.2 million absentee ballot requests. Um, and what you saw happen was that the US Supreme Court was asked to step in and give a little bit more time to clarify the rules, and they shut that down 5-4 along strict party lines. Mm -hmm. um, so imagine now how that plays out in, in multiple states. If yeah. there, it, you know, we are going to be, exp I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and some national leaders have called yeah. you know, that if there's another coronavirus package that is negotiated, that right. that Democrats need to leverage that to guarantee right. universal mail-in ballots. For Democrats no absolutely need to be forcing Republicans to expand the amount of money that is available for vote by mail and to change the law that... I mean, as it is right now, only in two thirds of the states can you um, cast an absentee ballot without an excuse. In one third of these states, you need an excuse and a pandemic is not enough. Um, so we need fair access to absentee ballots for everybody. We need this to be properly funded in every state so that these election boards are ready. They have the scanners that they need so that the laws can be changed so that the votes can be counted on time. I mean, in Pennsylvania and in Michigan, two states that were pretty important back in 2016, pretty close, you have laws on the books that say you can't open any ballots until election day. That might work when 10% of your votes are absentee, are absentee but mm -hmm. when uh, two-thirds are, you might not have a result for a week. And then imagine what the president is going to do going on claiming a voter fraud every single night on the news as the numbers change. He's already trying to poison the idea of vote by mail. Now, vote by mail is not perfect. Vote by mail uh, has got many challenges. Um, if you are in rural areas, if you are in tribal land, if you're in public housing, you might not have safe and secure and equal access to the mail. Um, in my new book, I drive around in Utah in San Juan County, where, which mm -hmm. is the size of New Jersey, and there are three post offices. Yeah. Uh, and you have to go hours in between these post offices. Uh, and if you are a tribal elder, you might make that trip five, every five or six weeks, maybe. Yeah. Um, if at all. And these post offices are not safe. They are in the back of gas stations. You see the mail just, you know, thrown in dumpsters. It may or may not be getting to people. Um, in many states, what you see are young voters and voters of color are the first to have their votes uh, thrown out when it's vote by mail because of signature matching um, 
requirements. And laws in many states are not equal on whether or not they have to tell you if you have um, a signature match problem. Yeah. So there's, there, there are yeah. lots of things that have to be done. And we've got 200 days left to kind of figure <laughs> them all out. Yeah. So you get the sense that the Republican plan here is to slow it down, to make it really, really difficult to do all of the stuff you've got to do, to inadequately fund it, and now there's stories about the, the post office not even being yes. properly. Yeah, funded. that's scary. So all of this all of this works in one direction. Yeah. So not a perfect system for vote by mail, but definitely something we need to fight for and protect. And um, you brought up San Juan County, which is also another um, gerrymandering story with sure. a good ending. It was um, it's a majority native county. Um and it had had a majority, I'm trying to remember exactly, I think it was a county commission. Um, I think I'm using the right term for the county for years. And um, the Navajo Nation and some of the other native leaders in the area actually filed a lawsuit. They used census data and they used the Voting Rights Act and they um, changed the gerrymandering of the county. And it actually really impacted a local issue. So when um, Trump diminished Bears Ears mm -hmm. National Monument, you know, one of his big things was federal government, not interfering with local government. And he talked about that county not supporting the monument designation for Bears, Bears Ears, but now that it's actually representative of the people that live there, exactly. um, for whom that site is not only important, but sacred, um, the county now supports um, maintaining that site. And so I think that there are a lot of those um, stories out there about the importance of access. Um, I wanted to switch topics for a minute and Steve ask you about something that you've uh, written about recently, um, which is that as we're talking about the vice president um, being a woman, the vice president nominee for the Democratic Party, um, that you've argued that that person should actually be a woman of color. Um, first of all, I could not agree more, but for all the naysayers who will say things like identity doesn't matter or we need to look at people people's policies and politics and history. You know, I just um, tweeted something about that today and already I have people in my mention saying, but we, we can't just do it based on identity. We need to make sure that that person's politics are in line um, with what we believe as a party, um, which of course is true, but I think is a way to escape um, the more important conversation about how we build a more representative democracy. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak to that and what you've written about before. Yeah, so I've got a piece uh, in the New York Times around this that really looking at um, the specific weaknesses that Biden has and why, who he actually needs to fill those weaknesses. So that's the particular point. Then there's also the meta point that I was making before in a society that has a, as profound a uh, gender pay gap and racial wealth gap as we do, people all keep, keep saying, oh, it can't be about identity. Those are identity-based realities. And so you can't create something, you can't create a problem by focusing on identity and then say, we're not going to look at identity in terms of redressing the problem. So there's a real fundamental challenge just from the starting point conceptually. But even putting that aside, looking specifically at Biden, and what I talk about in this piece is he has three major weaknesses and three major challenges, right? So one is young people. I mean, his performance by young people was extraordinarily bad, right? Even the, like Michigan, where he won largely uh, by, by a significant margin, he had 19% of the, of the vote of, of young people under 30. And I want to just say, too, when we talk about Biden losing the young vote, in some states, we're talking about people under 30, but in some states, it's people under 40. In some states, he lost people under 50. So I think when we hear young vote, people think, okay, college age people, you know, people in their early 20s, but it's a much bigger group than that. But yes, go on. Right. So that, that's a one huge need that he has. Then uh, he, uh, there's Latino vote, right? He lost the Latino vote in every single state that actually voted. Um, and that is now the largest non-white population um, within the country. And then third, which maybe I should say was first, is the issue of black enthusiasm. And this is my biggest fear and concern for him. 
And I'm already hearing it from people around, uh, around his campaign. It's like, oh, we're fine with black people. He did well with black people because he had such large support from African-Americans in the primaries. First, not appreciating that the reason so many black people voted for him in the primaries is because they were confident and hopeful that white people would vote for him. And so it's like, well, here's the guy who'll do well with white people. We ran a you know, woman last time and sexism undermined it. Let's get somebody in there who those folks will go for. So there's some level of calculation. But even putting that aside, more fundamentally, Clinton also did extraordinarily well <coughs> in the primaries against young people and then went with a white running mate. And so she printed an all-white ticket that did not incite, inspire, and enthuse uh, and, and motivate people to actually come out in large numbers. Black voter turnout fell to a lowest level in 16 years. And we lost Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania for all the obsession with, you know, white working class in those states. We're also talking about Detroit, Milwaukee, Philadelphia. Yep. So that's the, e that's the easiest vote in terms of the most likely reliable Democratic vote, but it's got to be inspired and motivated and in, 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 in turned out in big numbers. Mm -hmm. So all of that argues for, from an electoral advantage standpoint, having uh, a woman of color on the ticket. And then if you look even more deeply at the numbers around the past electoral performance of the from people being mentioned in terms of the various, the statewide races they've run in, Stacey Abrams does stand out, right, out of Georgia, that she won young people in Georgia by 25 points, whereas, Ob I didn't even realize this, so I was working on this piece, Obama lost young people in Georgia when he ran in 2008 by three points. Wow. And Stacey had a 28 point improvement over Obama's performance among young people in Georgia. She actually, uh, of all the people running, did best among Latinos. 62% of Latinos voted for her. Even um, Cortez Masta, who is Latina, got 61% in Nevada. Um, and then there is nobody who, is, who has turned out more black people to vote than Stacey Abrams. And that the level of uh, increase they had 2014 or 2018, she got 93% of the vote. Um, so I would argue that the data shows that that is the person who actually would be his strongest ally. Um, but there's also our other, you know, uh, women of color who could also have some of the uh, benefit that he needs um, with those constituencies as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that speaks to something else you wrote um, in a column for The Guardian before Super Tuesday, which again feels like eight years ago. <laughs> So much has changed since then. Um, but you wrote, whoever wins the nomination will owe their success to the love and support of people of color. The question is, you wrote, will a nominee love them back? Yeah. Um, and I think we saw that both with Biden and Sanders, you know, um, you know, back to back. I think you wrote this right after South Carolina. So it was right after the Latino vote carried Sanders um, to victory in Nevada. And then Biden had that victory that was a complete U-turn for his candidacy in South Carolina. Um, and so now that Biden is the nominee, um, what do you think that not only he, but the Democratic Party as a whole need to prioritize in 2020? Well, it is this issue we've been talking about in terms of getting out the, the voters of color, right? And you, if you the, extrapolate out the reality of uh, racial wealth gap, then there are many more obstacles to voting. If you mm -hmm. don't have as much money, right? It's from you know, you know, harder to get off a job. You may have more than one job. You have childcare. You have transportation. So that requires resources to be able to help people overcome those obstacles to be able to get out and vote. So that then means you need to. Add, and then the program you're talking about in in uh, in North Dakota, right? You have to, a lot of that was hiring people who either are from or have connections to the community to do the work of going door to door. So that it's not rocket science. But it's not a priority among many, too many people in the Democratic Party. So you've got, uh, you know, you get the largest super PAC parties, USA. Those are going to spend $150 million in this election, but they're only going to do television and, and ads and digital ads. So they're not actually getting people to talk to people. And even if you can't go door to door pandemic wise, you can call them up, right, in terms of actually have that kind of. So the resources are not being allocated in that fashion. At one point in time, uh, before you saw the bill from the primaries, uh, Bloomberg was going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to try to defeat Trump. And so he's got $63 billion, right? So even after $800 million that he spent, <laughs> is that he still has tons of money to be able to try to step up. 
but he's not going to, um, he's now, you know, he's giving 18 million, which for him is pocket change um, to the Democratic Party. So why doesn't he invest 100, 200 million dollars in actually hiring up people from these communities to make sure people get out to vote? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what my frustration is. It's not that complicated, but it requires a level of prioritization of how the assets and that are going to be allocated. Yeah. Um, yeah, when I, I used to work as a community organizer in Baltimore on the East Coast, and we did a two-year campaign where we quadrupled voter turnout at one polling place. Wow. And so in um, a primary election, so not the general election, we had um, higher voter turnouts than during like a regular general uh, presidential election. And it was through doing everything from like, you know, if you come to this cookout and you have a voter ID card, you get a free hot dog, doing door knocking, doing calls, taking people to the polls. Um, there was a pastor in the community, Elder Harris, who, um, it was a great gimmick, but um, he lived on the roof of his church until 500 people voted in early voting <laughs> to get people to the polls. And it made this enormous difference where um, it was so hard to get even a city council person or like a state representative or a state senator to a community meeting. But then once they saw that that neighborhood voted, they were there every month. It made such a big difference. And so David, as our last question before we have to wrap up, I was wondering if you could talk about the importance of local elections. Um, because, you know, it is so hard not to focus on Trump. I mean, we live in a media cycle that is the Trump show, but we also live in the nightmare that has been the Trump presidency. And for a lot of really good reasons, people are hyper-focused on getting Trump out of the White House. But that is only one piece of the puzzle um, to really protecting our democracy. So in closing, can you talk some about how um, we also need to be thinking about local elections in November? The nightmare of the Trump presidency began long before we elected Donald Trump. And it will not end with the defeat of Donald Trump because of the way that the Republican Party has systematically warped electoral rules in this country. Um, this has been a process that has been going on for a long, long time. I mean, the right to vote and the fight over the right to vote um, has been with us from the very founding of the country um, and is no less so in our politics today. Um, and what we need to keep in mind as 2020 arrives is that yes, we are electing a president. We are also electing state legislatures. We are electing the US House. We are electing a third of the US Senate. We are electing people up and down at the ballot. This decade of our politics was largely created by the 2010 election in which Democrats simply did not show up. They believed after 2008 that this was um, a, a coalition of the ascendant, that uh, changing American demographics and uh, you know, generations on the rise would do the work for us. And it, it doesn't work that way. Um, you need to show up and vote every single election um, because Republicans did. They showed up in 2010. They had a plan. They executed it. They won state legislatures. They redrew uh, the nation. And as it is right now, 59 million Americans live in a state in which one or both uh, chambers of the state legislature is controlled by the party that won fewer votes in 2018. All 59 million of those people live in a state in which Democrats get more votes, Republicans hold all the power. In those states, they have gone after your right to vote. They've gone after your right to healthcare and reproductive rights and to organize a union and the environment, the ability of localities to pass laws uh, that, you know, that uh, the ability of, of states to override laws passed by local governments. All of this is a growing and creeping anti-majoritarianism in our politics. It is aimed at holding down the changing demographics and color of the nation, and it can work because it has worked this entire decade for the Republicans. 
Uh, yeah. They had a choice in 2010 mm. of which direction they were going to take after Barack Obama and the Democrats walloped mm. them in 2008. They could have decided to find a way to talk to all Americans and try to persuade voters. And this is the advice given them in the autopsy, the famous GOP autopsy, or they could try to put barriers in front of people in the ballot box and make it harder for people who don't, who aren't on their side to vote. That's the path they took. That's the path that's going to have to be defeated. It's not going to be easy because they control courts and they have to be defeated on these maps. But if we don't do it in 2020, our next shot at these maps comes in 2030. And God knows what this country looks like if that is the case, if they are successful. But the good news, and I'll wrap up. I'm sorry, I saw that look. (laughs) The good news is that around the country, whether it's North Dakota, whether it is the Medicaid reform that was passed in Idaho, whether it is felon voting rights in Florida, whether it's the redistricting commissions in Michigan, Missouri, Colorado, and Utah, all of which passed with big majorities. I think Americans have, are uh, understand that fair elections matter. And I think we are learning really, really quickly here that, you know, I mean, Dr. King talked about the moral arc of the universe being long, but bending towards justice. And it only bends towards justice when all of us in every election have got our hands on it and we pull it towards justice because there are folks who are trying to pull it the other way. We can't let that happen. Yeah. I can just add it because two quick things on that is that, so yes, this local election, if we, if we do step back and look at and think about this country being in this battle between the coalition of restoration, the coalition of transformation, which I argue like, sometimes jokingly, but not actually fundamentally at all, is an extension of the, of the civil war within this country. Mm-hmm. We had a civil war, it's a fundamental, and then we, the, uh, uh, we had reconstruction, and then that was attacked. And we are in a post reconstruction era now in terms of where, what direction we're actually gonna go. Those kinds of national battles take place at state and local levels all over the country. Similar to the way that uh, the rise of you know, Trump was predicated on things like the Tea Party, these mm-hmm. different efforts at the state and local level. Similarly, we have the potential, we have the numbers at the state and local level to be able to advance these types of changes and create more of a national uh, progressive social justice foundation and momentum. And so we've, there have been, I believe, eight governorships have flipped mm-hmm. hands since Trump actually got elected, right? So you've got that. And then you've got think, uh, progressive policies taking place in different cities as well. And so lots of pe- much of the country lives in those different areas. So we're not at the mercy solely of what actually happens in D.C. and from this White House. And you're seeing it play itself out in this pandemic. Right, where you have more enlightened and fact-based driven leadership at the state and local level. Where I live in San Francisco, which is one of the first cities in the country to actually have a shutdown to be able to flatten the curve. And you're seeing the results of that now. If you extrapolate that out to the politics and the public policies, we can start to advance a social justice public policy agenda all over the country in these different pockets or even more than pockets where we have this new American majority that's rooted in a more social justice. Social vision. justice, social justice, justice. And I think um, just I'll end on like one tidbit. Um, where I live in Oklahoma is one of the reddest states in the country. And when you look at the county map, there's this little blue dot in the northeastern corner, and that's the county where I live, Cherokee County. And my state representative is a Democrat in a house uh, where Republicans have a super majority. And so Republicans have been trying to bust that. He's actually up for re-election right now, um, Matt Meredith. Um, they're, they're trying in all their power to crack that hole. But here, you know, in a sea of red in the middle of the country, there's this really strongly Democrat county. And one of 
of the reasons that is, is because the party has been really active here for decades. You know, we have a young Democrat club, we have voter turnout, you know, during election cycles, they open up offices, there are monthly meetings, you know, things that I think a lot of people don't think would be taking place in Oklahoma um, are happening here too. Um, and so I think that, you know, this whole conversation just goes um, to underline that um, electoral politics comes down to math at the end of the day. And moving those numbers are things that we have to think about in a comprehensive and a holistic way that I think um, for the past decades, Republicans have sort of out strategized <laughs> and out gained the Democratic Party. And we not only need to out strategize, but we need to outwork them um, if we're going to see those results that we need to see um, in 2020. So I thank everybody um, for tuning in and for listening um, to voting rights on rigging the rules for the rising American electorate today. Um, and why don't we just leave um, where viewers can find and read your work. Um, Steve, do you want to go first? Um, democracyincolor.com uh, um, is where you can find our podcast and links to the different work that we're doing. And so, and then we've got a Facebook uh, page of Democracy in Color as well. People can follow our work and the things that I'm, we're putting out there as well. David? Uh, this is Unrigged, How Americans Are Battling Back to Save Democracy, newly published, available in bookstores everywhere, and your independent bookstores need you. The more optimistic follow-up to uh, Rat Fucked, Why Your Vote Doesn't Count, the story of how Republicans gerrymandered the nation. And I can say that on the Bay Area Book Festival virtual podcast. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. And anybody who wants to uh, follow my work can find me on Twitter. I'm just at Rebecca Nagel. So thank you so much for turning in. And whatever you do, don't forget to vote.